ladies and gentlemen, uh, you've all, uh, some of you may have already heard Bruce previously, but uh, it's uh, glad to have him here to speak today about the latest Pew Global Attitudes Project survey. Um, being a newspaper man, I hope you've also read it, some of it in, in the newspaper, uh, my newspaper in particular. Um, <laughs> um, and an excellent account of what. <laughs> um, but uh, otherwise, he's, he's here in person to give his, his own value-added version uh, of, of events. So Bruce Stokes has been, um, is, is now the director of, the, of Global Economic Attitudes at Pew Research Center. Um, <coughs> he was a journalist. He still is, actually, a, a writer for the National Journal. Um, and I know him best as a, uh, because we're both members of the Aspen Institute's uh, Indo-U.S. Strategic Dialogue. Uh, and this is probably about his 10th or something visit to India, so he's no stranger to us. So I'll, having said all of that, I'll ask uh, Bruce to please go ahead and make his presentation. I certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity to share these results with you, uh, and I look forward to your comments and questions because it, that's certainly what I learn. I learn from your comments and questions a great deal as we uh, shape this survey in the future. We've been doing this survey now for 11 years uh, in countries all over the world. This is a result of a 21-nation survey, uh, but we will begin next year doing this survey every six months in India, uh, so there will hopefully be uh, an increasing number of stories to tell, uh, not only about India, but about how India compares in its attitudes compared to those in, in the rest of the world. And I think that's probably some of the most interesting data in, in this survey. Uh, we were in the field uh, between uh, mid-March and mid-April of this year. Um, and uh, we did a survey of 4,000 people across India in uh, 14 states. So it includes 86% of the Indian population has been covered by the survey, so we think it's a fairly representative sample, uh, urban and rural, uh, uh, and about 29% of the survey was uh, urban, uh, which is roughly the population, the urban population of India, so we think it's a, a very representative sample. Um, it's not uh, surprising to any of you who've been uh, awake for the last two years. Uh, people are dissatisfied with the direction of the country. Uh, what's interesting is that 38 percent satisfaction level in 2012 is down 13 percentage points in just a year, and that's one of the steepest drops uh, of any of the 21 countries that we surveyed. Um, basically, uh, people uh, are, um, uh, they say that their concern about the economy is driving their concern about the direction of the country, uh, very strongly so. Uh, basically, people are, uh, Worried about the uh, state, the immediate state of the economy. Uh, as you can see, only 49% say the economy is doing well today. Uh, even fewer think that the economy is going to get better over the next uh, 12 months. And you can see a 15 percentage point drop in optimism about the economy in just one year. Uh, again, uh, not good news. Um, this is an interesting uh, uh, piece of data. 66% of Indians say that they think it will be difficult for their kids to do as well as they are doing. Now, you need to put this in context. One is we ask people, do you, are you doing better than your parents? Overwhelmingly, people said yes, not surprisingly. People, we ask people, are you doing better than you did five years ago? Again, people say yes. Again, not surprisingly. 66% say, though, my kid is going to have a tougher time doing as well as I'm doing. That is not so good, but you need to put it in context. Of the 21 countries that we serve, feel worse about the future for their kids than Indians do. So, in absolute terms, India is not doing so well. In relative terms, on this particular question, they're doing better than people, most people around the world. Uh, again, uh, it's all, things are all relative here. But you'll see on relative measures, uh, there are some other problems. Who do you blame for your economic problems? It's the government. The 92 percent of the public that says they blame the government is the highest percentage of any of the 21 countries we surveyed. Now, bear in mind, in most countries, people blame the government. 
Only in a couple of European countries do they blame the banks first and the government second. But uh, it is interesting that people are more likely to blame the government here than in any other country we surveyed. 64% of the Indian public blame themselves. Now, that is higher than any, of any other country except Tunisia. Now, to be honest, what we don't know is what people meant by that. Do they mean, I take responsibility for my own, my own economic condition and I'm to blame? Or do, do they mean, I'm doing okay, but this guy promised he's really lazy, right? <laughs> well, we, that's what we don't know. Uh, but uh, it is interesting that Indians uh, are more uh, self-blaming than most other people. Uh, thank you very much for not blaming us. <laughs> uh, we ask people what are the top economic problems. Um, bear in mind, this is very big. This is not just big problem. This is a very big problem. As you can see, the top three issues are economics. The next three are crime and corruption. Bear in mind, we asked this question before the coal scandal, so that number might have gone up. Uh, I think, to my mind, this is the single most interesting piece of data. It's not surprising that people think that the country is going in the wrong direction. It's not surprising that people think the economy is not good. You just have to look at the data, and the recent experiences suggest that. What's interesting is that that change in the last year has been greater in India than it has been in most other places in the world. Uh, and it seems to me if I were an Indian, that's the kind of thing that I would be most worried about. It's not my absolute number, which as you can see, look, 49% of Indians say that um, the, um, uh, the economic conditions are good. That's, you know, that's not great, but it's not horrible. I mean, it's 19% in Europe, it's 31% in the U.S. It's just the change is the direction of that uh, attitude, which I think is probably the most uh, important thing, and it's a relative problem in the sense that Indians are feeling worse about the economy faster than other people. Um, again, we, take, we took a look at attitudes by income group. Uh, it's not surprising that the rich feel better about the economy than the poor. It'd be news that they didn't feel better about the economy than the poor. But what's interesting is this is the difference between the attitudes of the rich and the poor on these issues. And it's a fairly huge gap between the attitudes of the rich and the poor. And it's a much bigger gap than in any of the other emerging markets. And if you combine this with the fact that the third leading economic problem in our survey was the growing gap between the rich and the poor, and we have another question where we ask people, are the rich getting rich while the poor get poor? And overwhelmingly, Indians say yes. It, this does suggest to me there's a problem in India in terms of attitudes between the rich and the poor, uh, which bears watching. I don't want to overinterpret that. But if inequality is a growing global concern, it seems to me that it's a growing concern in India as well. Uh, we ask about a whole series of other questions, international questions. I can tell you, in most international questions, in rural areas, you've got so many, high un so many unknowns, 30, 40, 50 percent unknowns, that I will report later. We, I'll show you the urban data. On Pakistan, you didn't have to do that. All Indians have an attitude. Just as all Indians have an, an opinion about the economy, all Indians have an, attitude, an opinion about Pakistan. Uh, they think Pakistan is uh, the most serious threat facing uh, India, uh, much more of a threat than the Naxalites or China. Uh, Indians don't like Pakistanis, don't like Pakistan. Only 13 percent have a favorable view of Pakistan, but they want the relationship to improve. I can tell you Pakistanis don't like Indians because we do this survey in Pakistan, but Pakistanis feel the same way. They want their relationship to improve. I think that the new visa arrangement is a reflection of the policy implications of this data, which is there's support for doing more to improve the relationship, even if we don't like those guys across the border, uh, which is interesting. Uh, again, we ask about India and the rest of the world. As you can see, basically, uh, Urban Indians, those who um, uh, have an opinion, are more likely to have an opinion about things outside of India, uh, 
like America more than they uh, have a favorable view of Russia or the EU or China. Again, urban Indians are not terribly disposed, well disposed towards Pakistan. Um, and as you can see, there's a, there's a, on across a range of issues, there's a, a support uh, for, for example, there's a 60% confidence in President Obama. Uh, basically, people believe the U.S.-Indian relationship has improved in, in the last few years. By the way, Indians overwhelmingly want to see Obama reelected. urban Indians, those who have an, an opinion. Um, we did ask a question, uh, who's the leading economic power in the world? 46% uh, of Indians said the U.S. Uh, you might say, well, gee, that's kind of odd because everybody knows that by all the statistical measures, it's the largest economy in the world, it's the richest economy in the world. The reality is only 36% of the public in the 21 countries we survey thinks the U.S. is still the world's economic power. Now, that may be statistically incorrect, but in fact, Indians feel better about the U.S. as an economic power than does the rest of the world. Um, China, obviously a big issue uh, for Indians. Uh, basically, a, a plurality have an unfavorable view of China. A uh, plurality see the relationship as one of hostility. And a majority say that India's growing economy is bad for, uh, China's growing economy is bad for India. Uh, Iran's obviously a question in the news. Uh, Basically, and this is a good example of why you have to dig into this data. 65% of rural people don't know, don't have an, don't know about, about Iran to have an opinion. So when you cite national data and say, well, gee, only 28% uh, have an unfavorable view of Iran, well, that's because you have 60, two thirds of the rural public has no opinion. Uh, a plurality have an unfavorable view of uh, Iran, if you look at only the urban population, 52% uh, uh, do not want them to acquire nuclear weapons. And among those who don't want them to acquire nuclear weapons, basically people support economic sanctions. And if pushed, they would be in favor of military action. Treat that with a grain of salt. The question is only of those people who don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons. It doesn't include rural people because basically they don't have an opinion. Uh, and the question didn't say, and the bombs are going to stop dropping tomorrow. But still, on the other hand, when Indian officials say, well, our people wouldn't let us do anything about Iran, I mean, there is some support here for, for doing something about the Iranian uh, nuclear situation. Um, we asked people around Asia what they thought about India. Uh, you are uh, favor very favorably viewed in Japan, uh, not so favorably viewed in Pakistan, not a surprise, or in China. Uh, Indian values, it seems to me, are under stress as they are in all societies, especially modernizing societies around the world. What we found was that if you ask people, do they like the pace of modern life, not surprisingly, 58% of young people do. 63% of college-educated people like the pace of modern life. Higher-income people and urban people like the pace of modern life. Not to be a, not surprising at all. Yet half the population thinks their traditional way of life is being lost. I can tell you this is widespread around the world. Basically, people are uneasy about the impact of modern life on their traditional way of life. What's interesting in India is it's the very same people who like the modern life. It is college educated people, it is urban people. So people basically like modern life and it makes them uneasy at the same time. And you know we can laugh about this and say, oh, people don't know their own mind, but think about this. This is just a human element. This is just the human element of, of public opinion. Basically, people are infinitely capable of holding mutually contradictory emotions. You know, you're angry at your kid and you love your kid at the same time. And in this case, people like modern life and yet it makes them uneasy. It's a potential source of social tension. Uh, interesting question to ask, it seems to me, in a state that since uh, uh, independence has been socialist, uh, in essence, you have we ask a question, is freedom to pursue life's goal without interference from the state more important uh, than the state 
playing an active role. So nobody's in need. A majority of the public says we want the state to play less of a role. And this includes 47% of people in rural areas. So even those people who argue and may benefit more from the state, I have some doubts about it. Uh, again, you're, it's probably not surprising that college educated people, higher income people want uh, the state to play a lesser role. Um, so you have a range of developments uh, from this survey uh, on Indian values. I think one of the interesting things here is that our way of life needs to be protected against foreign influence. Eight out of ten Indians believe that. Uh, this is another, this is a policy implication of the worry about the traditional way of life being threatened. We have another series of questions we ask about, about American, America's image in India. Indians like American science and technology. Indians like American way of doing business. What they don't like are American movies, music, etc. They like Bollywood, not Hollywood. And they don't like the spread of American cultural images, issues, and, and, and images and values in Indian society. And you see that again here in terms of uh, we want to protect uh, uh, ourselves against uh, foreign influence. Again, if some Indian politician proposes doing something about foreign influence in the culture, you're probably going to get a lot of support for it out of this. Um, all of this data and much more is available on our website. Uh, a report about India, but also a range of reports, including a very interesting report, which I highly recommend to you, on the role of Asian Americans in American society. It was just released last month uh, with, a, with a special section on Indian Americans in American society. Uh, you may not realize Asian Americans are the fastest growing minority group in the United States, now growing faster than Hispanics. Uh, they are also the best educated minority group, and they are also the richest minority group. Um, so it is a growing uh, aspect of domestic American life, uh, the role of um, Asian Americans in our society, including, I might say, Indian Americans. Uh, I can tell you, I would have been willing to bet you almost anything that we would, 10 years ago, that we would never have an Indian American governor of a state. We now have Indian American governors of two states. And oh, by the way, one of them is a woman. And these states are both in the US South. <laughs> so this is where things are changing very rapidly in the states. And Indian Americans are playing a very big role in that. So thank you. about surveys like this, which uh, go on and on about different topics and, and jump all over it, is that as you're watching, there'll always be, almost everybody in the audience will look at this and say, that's, that's not true, or uh, that's amazing, I didn't know that. Um, <clears throat> um, so I'll just ask you a few questions before I think we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, if you were to define the profile of an Indian what struck you when you went? Because this is not just about the survey. The full survey, as many of you may know, incorporates 20 other nations as well, which we didn't have time to go through here. Uh, what was the outstanding characteristic of an Indian versus the other 20 countries? Uh, it's a great question. I think that. We'll just, we'll, I'll use this. What struck me uh, in looking at this data was the, um, was the relative change be, compare, in, in India compared to the rest of the world. It's not surprising that uh, people are glum about the economy, they're worried about the future, uh, all the underlying economic data would suggest they should be, uh, but the decline in optimism and appreciation for the economy in India was so much greater than in other countries, especially the countries that India has to compete against, China, Brazil. And um, uh, what we don't know from public opinion data, and you would be much uh, a better place to uh, interpret this than I would, is, is this just an, relative to what 
what's going on in the economy this makes sense, or were people's expectations raised too high? Uh, we all know that, that two and three years ago there were pronouncements by the government and economists that 10% was certainly going to happen in India. It was just right over the horizon. India was going to be growing faster than China. And now that that hasn't happened, uh, has this contributed to the disappointment? We don't know, but I mean, my guess is it must have. Um, the other thing that, uh, that always comes to mind about this, particularly about the Pew survey, Daryl, as we, as, as anybody knows, India, we, we survey ourselves on a regular basis, but we don't often survey rural people. Um, and in this case, the methodology was interesting because you used, they used eight local Indian languages in the questioning. Um, in fact, I don't think you used English uh, in the least in the methodology list I saw. Uh, I'm sure we did, though. Okay, but anyway, but there were eight other languages. Normally, in in most surveying in India, you tend uh, to actually have a very limited uh, spread of vernacular languages. So the result is, I thought, a, a particularly interesting uh, point of view. One of the things that does struck me about the rich and poor, you may have read there was a survey recently by uh, a study by uh, the. Uh, University of Pennsylvania, which noted that, yes, while Indians are concerned about rich and poor incomes, social unrest in India has been declining quite dramatically over the past 15, 20 years, and there's still no real evidence of that stopping. Mm -hmm. It's like, yes, the income levels are increasing, but let's say, unlike, let, let's say, Latin America, yeah. uh, you're not seeing that being necessarily coming through uh, in actual activity on the street, if you wish. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it, it's interesting. If you, if you parse through this data, what I found, I mean, there is a huge difference between the rich and the poor and their attitudes. Uh, and like I say, that, that should be worrisome. But there are also some real differences between the middle income people and the, and the rich. And this is where you may see it was the, the people in the middle who had the highest expect, we don't know because we, we can't go back and look, but it would be reasonable to assume that it was middle-income people who had the highest expectations and thus were the most uh, dissatisfied. They are probably the least likely to go out in the streets, at least initially. Um, uh, and that may be one of the explanations why you don't see the kind of social unrest, as you say, that you might, over time, begin to worry about. Um, so I, I now throw it to the audience. Uh, this is being videotaped, so I'd like you to identify yourself. Um, and if you have an affiliation that you want to talk about, uh, please do so. Um, and just wait for the microphone to come to you. Hi, I'm Mohit. Uh, I'm a teacher with Teach for India. I teach in a government school, uh, especially underprivileged kids. My question is particularly around 62% uh, of people said that they blame themselves, like us Indian. Right. And I want to interpret in the way that is it more from the sense of ownership they are driving that this is my country in a way if I'm not directly blaming myself mm. but society on a whole, not just government because at the end of the day we select government. Mm. But at the same time I'm also interested to know were there any signs of any action leading out of that sense of ownership? Did you get any hint of people saying that yes I blame myself but what am I doing about it? The big question is what will I do about it? So I just want to know about that from both of you. Very good question, and by the way, I commend you for being part of Teach for India. I think it's great. Um, uh, the short answer is we don't know. Um, uh, it seems to me that, and this is why I love to do this, because it, it gives me, I, we can go back and look. I mean, for example, do those people who said I, we blame ourselves for this, are they also people who are more likely to say we want the state play a smaller role in the society. That would be one of the ways to test, right? Which would imply I have to do this myself. Um, we have not asked recently in India, I hope to do in one of our future surveys, a question we've asked in the past, which is uh, do you believe that your um, outcome in life, your fate, is determined by you or by society? Because we know in the United States, people overwhelmingly say, I'm the, I'm the master of my own fate. And in Europe, we know, people say, no, 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 this is all societal. Uh, and so the question would be, if you ask that question in India, would people believe that they were masters of their... Now, the overlying factor, though, here is also you have a caste system. 
and, and, and actually one of the earlier discussions I had today, someone suggested you got to get at the question in India of does society or caste you know, determine my fate? And I think that's a, that's a great question for us to ask, and we haven't, and we should have. Well, I'll just point out that, well, so one part of self-blame is that if you blame our political system, well, we voted them in office. And <laughs> one of the things that I would like to have known ultimately in terms of self-blame is, was it higher among poorer income people? Because as you may know in India, our voting patterns are that the lower your income level is, the more likely you are to vote. I mean, people at the highest quintile of India is barely 15% voter turnout, and it's almost 70% at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, I'm General Chopra. I'm a senior war veteran. My connection with the U.S. is I helped the high-level team to formulate the Global Trends 2025 for the National Intelligence Council, right. and I'm going to Pennsylvania shortly. A short question and some observation sure. which you might like to comment on. The short question is, is there any reason why you excluded the Northeast, which has seven difficult states of India, large states of India, Jammu and Kashmir, and the two internal security affected states, right. Chhattisgarh and Charkhand, was it logistical or scare, yeah. whatever it was? Because yeah. you'd have got a certain amount of important opinion from there, which affects the country. Now my observation, the uh, kids and parents, generally, my impression is, including in the army, which is mm. what, a million plus strong, the kids are doing better than the parents. I know in my family, they're certainly doing better than me, and I'm a general. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a small fry either. Yeah, sure, sure. Amongst our troops, and I want to tell you this is very important, 95% yeah. of our troops come from the rural backward area. Every soldier and his family is doing much, much better. Right. I rode a bicycle. These guys are all riding scooters. Mm -hmm. So they're doing much, much better. So I don't know your statistic and my experience don't seem to agree. This uh, business of pessimism, you have partially mm -hmm. answered yeah. or corrected yourself. You see, when you get used to 8 9% over a period of 3 to 4 years, against my time, the Hindu growth rate was 3.5%. Right. Now when we read about 59 the first quarter being only 5% plus, right. there is a wave of pessimism. The only thing I go along with you is that since you are only projecting 12 months, which is a clever thing to do, like what we projected the Americans for Global Trends 2025, yeah. everything has gone wrong. <laughs> Nothing has happened correct. And mind you, all the big boys did it from your side. Yeah. And my last point is about India. I mean, if I look at India, we are still very family-oriented we still have a certain amount of respect for the elders. It's no longer commanding. I do not command my children or even in the village. But that respect continues and the bond is very strong. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chairman. A uh, couple of points. One is, uh, I, I think on your second question, uh, uh, we're in agreement. I mean, our, our survey shows that if you ask people, are you doing better than your parents, if they ask your kids, are they, they, our survey shows yes. They, they'll, they'll acknowledge that they're doing better than their parents. In fact, they're doing better than they did five years ago. But it's just a question of whether, if you ask your kids, do they think their kids are going to have an easier time or a more difficult time having a standard of living as good as they? That's where people are pessimistic. Um, in terms of the, the states we did not survey in, uh, it's my understanding that it was too difficult slash dangerous slash expensive. And those things are all tied together. Um, uh, and, and it was because of some of the unrest in some of those states that we could not survey. Um, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to do better uh, the next time. My name is Noni Chawla. I'm a management consultant, which means I'm unemployed. Uh, <laughs> um, my question relates to uh, your finding that 92% of the people blame the government. And I'm just curious to find out, do they blame the state government or the central government? Is there any way or any indication? Do they distinguish between the two? 
Well, I mean, that's, that's our, our shortcoming. We didn't ask them to differentiate. Uh, we asked them about the government. And I think that would be an interesting uh, subdivision if you could ask a follow-up question. Is it the federal, you know, is it the national government? Is it the state level government? Even is your local government? Whatever. Uh, but we did, well, unfortunately, we, did, we didn't ask that. Hi, Lachlan Strawn. I'm Australia's Deputy High Commissioner. Uh, the number you had for the level of uneasiness about foreign cultural influences affecting yeah. India, three questions. One is, is that number noticeably higher than other target countries that you looked at? Yeah. Secondly, over time, is that number going up or down? Is that sense of uneasiness increasing or decreasing? And did you break it down by income group and urban and rural? Uh, the uh, last question is simple to answer. We can do that. I, I, I have not done that, but uh, if you want to send me an email, I'd be happy to, to, to break it down. Uh, what we uh, can't do is in this survey, we only asked that question in China uh, uh, about uh, controlling foreign influence. Uh, and I can't off the top of my head remember what the Chinese number is. We haven't released it yet. That may be why I can't remember it. We are releasing next week the Chinese numbers. Um, uh, but we have asked that question in the past in other countries, and it's a fairly high number in most countries. Uh, uh, it, there seems to be a, a cultural nationalism in many societies. Uh, I can't off the top of my head remember relative Indian cultural nationalism relative to other cultural, uh, I, it, I can't remember the exact numbers. The Indian number is fairly high, though. Uh, as, as, you, as you can note. Um, and um, the over time numbers, uh, we haven't asked the question enough actually to, to enough times to be able to, to trace that. Uh, and we've changed our sample design in India just in the last two years when we're doing a national sample, not just an urban sample. So they, it's like comparing apples and oranges. Now going forward, I hope that we can ask that question not every year because it's not, it won't change that much every year. But certainly every few years, because it would be very interesting to see whether over time that number changes, goes it can't go up much higher, but it could probably go down, uh, or whether, in fact, it's just inherent that people don't like this stuff, even though they're consuming more and more of it. Because let's face it, the reality is uh, you can go out on the street here and buy the latest Hollywood movies, pirated maybe, but they're, they're still Hollywood movies. You can buy, the, you know, you can buy music that's foreign music. Uh, people watch television, and they watch a lot of foreign television um, and movies. Um, and there is, so there's this contradiction between people's behavior and what their kind of feelings are. Um, again, I would warn you, this is typical. Human beings just have contradictory emotions. Uh, you can see this in the US. People hate the fact that the American auto industry is not doing better than it is and they all drive Japanese cars. Well, you know, if they really cared enough, they'd buy more American-made cars. Uh, but uh, there's, so there's that, there's that tension. Um, the only thing I'd add when we get into the word foreign in India, it can be confusing. Uh, being a Bengali from Calcutta, I remember once at a wedding, uh, having some elderly relative rage about too many foreign influences in Bengali weddings. And I said, what? He says, look, they're dancing the Bhangra. I said, that's <laughs> I'm Anil Rajdan, former civil servant. Uh, two sets of questions. One is, you see, it's an attitude survey project. But I thought, you see, if you were asking about attitudes, you might have asked that what newspapers do you read, which language, mm -hmm. do you watch television, do you watch the 24 by 7, how often? And secondly, I mean, if you have an attitude and you work, you're living in a democracy, how often do you go out to vote for the local government, the state government, and the central government elections? Mm -hmm. And the last point I think I'd uh, take on with what Mr. Chavla had said. It's too general to ask, are you dissatisfied with the government? There are three or four tiers of government. Mm -hmm. Now, unless you specify what tier you're talking about, 
or what they're talking about. I think we've been messing up with democracy a long way because people don't care to vote for local government elections. Mm -hmm. Most problems that they have are concerning the local government. And we tend to generalize and think that they're blaming the central government. Um, well, one is I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. We have the same issue in the United States. People uh, generally say they don't like the government when in fact it's just the opposite. What we find is that people don't like the federal government and they tend to like their uh, local government. And they say they hate the Congress, but oh, I like my, my current representative. Um, uh, stay tuned on the, uh, some of that information issue. We are about to release in a couple of months uh, a comprehensive study around the world of technology use, including some of the questions that you just raised. I mean, where you get your information, how much are you online, how much you use social media, things of that nature. Um, we do ask in the US, but we've never done this uh, extensively abroad, you know, what more detailed questions about your, you know, do you watch Fox News versus NBC versus CBS? Um, uh, frankly, it's a question of money. I mean, you can, I mean, every question you ask costs money and you can only ask so many questions. I actually think it'd be a very interesting survey to do in other parts of the world. Uh, because you're right, it does, I mean, you can say, I, I read newspapers, well, which newspapers, you know, in which language? Uh, I watch television news exactly where and how. Um, I can tell you as an anecdote that the more you mine that information, the more interesting it is because we find that we have in the US and in Europe ask follow-up questions where you ask people, do you read the news? Do you follow the, we ask them, what do you follow in the news? and they'll tell us what they follow in the news. And then you ask them a, uh, a substantive question about what they said they followed. <laughs> like an objective question, uh, you say you're following, I don't know, I'm making this up. You're, you say you're following the war in Afghanistan, it's Afghanistan and Africa, Latin America. <laughs> and what you find is, and this is, I'm telling a story about my own people, American people have less news understanding than Europeans do. We've never done this in other parts of the world, but it'd be, to my mind, it's a fascinating story. Uh, and so I, I, we're, we're gonna do more of that. There'll be some coming out later, but we should do even, do, do even more of that. Hello, I'm uh, Nidhi Prabha Tiwari from an NGO called Democracy Connect. My question is on the um, attitude of Indians towards Pakistanis. Uh, you said a very low percentage uh, viewed Pakistanis favorably, right. but the percentage of people who are willing to, uh, who sort of support dialogue with Pakistanis is, right. is significant. Yes. So um, drawing from that, would you think that if a political party was to take up uh, dialogues with Pakistanis as a serious agenda, would you think they would get uh, great, a great sort of public support? Or do you think it's too, uh, yeah. sort of, uh, you know, superficial kind of a support? Uh, I, I just don't know. You, you would know India much better than I would. Um, clearly, it seems to me, if I were a politician and I saw that data, it would suggest to me that I can go further out on that limb than I maybe thought I could. Uh, uh, but but you, you raise it, you know, you're hinting at a more important question is that People often say they support something, but then when you go to do it, <laughs> they get criticized for it. So uh, I, I think we don't know here. But, but on the other hand, think of the conversation we would be having if not only did 13% of the population say they like Pakistan, but only 13% said they wanted to have a dialogue with Pakistan. We'd have, we'd have a totally different conversation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'd just add that if you look at the official policy, uh, of what's been happening in the government, both with Vajpayee and Manmohan Singh, they've actually been, in a way, already taking this line, which is that this country is, is a problem, but we, it's our neighbor, we have no choice. Uh, it's 200 million people living next to us, and we have to, and you can see this happening in India. The government goes out, does a peace process with Pakistan, often collapses spectacularly, 
I mean, it's unbelievable what happens sometimes. But when they resume the process again, even six months, eight months later, there is no serious criticism. Everybody just shrugs their shoulders, yes, we have no choice. And I think we're probably going to see another uh, similar process going on right now. Yeah. My name is Anupam Khanna. I'm with NASCOM. Uh, you have some very interesting data points. And I'll take, but what I wonder is to what extent do you or your methodology permit some connecting of the dots. Yeah. Uh, specifically, let me ask you about the China case, right. where most Indians seem to think it's a bad idea that China is growing, even though we are getting more and more integrated, it's our largest right. partner, right. and so on. It does it, could you relate it to any of the other points which are emerging in the su survey regarding attitudes about you know, dashed expectations, rivalry, or any other thing that could have done? Let me relate it. It's a little more sophisticated question. I don't want to take too much time. Other thing is I've recently been looking at other surveys and read this article by interview yesterday by Professor Atul Kohli, who is at Princeton. And uh, mm -hmm. the issue of partisan bias comes in. Mm -hmm. My son, actually, that's his PhD dissertation, is the issue of partisan bias in asking people about economic data. Mm -hmm. And he, I asked him uh, this. And I'm wondering to what extent, how can you correct it? And in, probably not, because you're not asking the political affiliation type question. But perhaps by connecting some of the dots, you might be able to get some very interesting factors yeah. of what is driving what. Well, I, I can't speak to the partisan issue in India. Uh, we do ask people their political affiliation. But the problem is you have so many parties in India that even with 4,000 interviews, Sometimes the number of people who actually belong to a particular party is so small out of that 4,000 that you really you can't methodologically correctly make a statement. Um, uh, you can in the U.S. because basically you have three parties. You have Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. Independents aren't an organized party, but by the way, they are the largest group uh, in the United States uh, voting public at this point. Um, uh, you raise an interesting question. I haven't looked at, I mean, what you could do is run, a, run an analysis that looked at if among those people who think that India, that China's gr economic growth is a bad thing for India, do people feel good, less good, or more good about the Indian economy? Haven't done this. Great, great question. I will do that. Um, my experience is often you've run these things, you're all excited, you're going to get some great answer, and it doesn't tell you anything. But you never know, and it's a, it's a good question. And, and my hope is, as we begin to do this every six months, you can begin to dig down deeper into some of these questions because uh, you have more, more uh, time. Uh, you know, if you don't ask it this time, you ask it the next time, and you can begin to analyze these things. That was a great question. And it is if one of the questions that pops into mind is that if you looked at those graphs, you saw actually that Pakistan, <coughs> Pakistanis are actually looking at India more favorably. The trend right. is actually upwards. Right. And one wonders if that's because the, f the trend line between Pakistan's views of the United States is going in the other direction. <laughs> and on the other hand, with the Japanese, I mean, it's, it's surged. I mean, given that very few Japanese actually visit India, they have an enormously high, probably the highest favorable rating of any country regarding right. India. Yeah. Uh, and wonder if that's connected to the fact that their favorable rating of China has been going through the, through the floor. Yeah. And you look at these and you wonder if there is some sort of connectivity. Right. Lots of people here. Can we yeah. just... Hi, I'm <coughs> Radhika Shapurji. Uh, I head up a public relations firm called IPAN Helen Olton and therefore was very keen to actually hear what you had to say on public opinion because that's what we deal, deal yeah. with. Uh, what would be interesting is, uh, in, in, in having done all of this, what do you think are actually the role models that shape this attitude, uh, both positive and negative? What do you really think in India and your sort of experience from other countries? Yeah. It would be interesting to hear what you have to say on that. Well, clearly, I think that the first um, uh, my first impression, and it's certainly borne out by some of the uh, regressions we've done, is show that it's attitudes towards the economy that drive some of these other negative attitudes, right? And, and one would presume that's 
the performance of the economy. Uh, you know, the average person doesn't know what the growth rate was, uh, but they'll have some overall impression. Now, what we don't know, and so this is my intuition, not from the data, is that I do think, as I said before, that this may be the price that India pays for unrealistic expectations. Um, as a, a, one of the questioners over here pointed out, and it is true that um, the Indian growth rate in the last quarter, while not wonderful, uh, you know, we Americans would die for that growth rate right now. And obviously, you're a developing country, and so you need a faster growth rate. I mean, that, there's a dynamic there. Unlikely we'll ever get 5.3% growth in, again. But um, when you expect 10 and you get 5.3, there's a disappointment factor. Um, now, were people unrealistic to raise expectations? At the time, they didn't think so. Every, every quarter, things were growing faster. Um, but uh, in retrospect, uh, hopefully, pundits and politicians going forward might say, you know, be careful what you predict, because if it doesn't, doesn't, isn't realized, then people uh, overly react. I'm Shingal, former civil servant. I have two short questions, both relating to HQ. <clears throat> First, uh, did you uh, also try to find out on what basis are these attitudes formed? How much is it based on personal experience and how much on media reports or 24-hour channels? And second, with regard to attitudes with, uh, about, particularly about USA, China, and Pakistan, mm -hmm. did you find any area-wise variations from east or south or north or west, state-wise variations or area-wise variations? Both, both very good questions. Um, we, we don't do any studies that try to figure out how attitudes are formed. I think that's actually beyond the scope of the kind of research we do. It's probably uh, better done by academics, and, and I think it's probably better done by people who aren't public opinion pollsters. I mean, it, this is a psychological issue. I mean, you can make, you can make, um, assumptions or, or try to, you know, try to intuit why people might think the way they do. But I can tell you, based on, on my experience with public opinion surveys, you couldn't do that by asking the person why they think the way they think the way they do. People don't know why they think what they do. They just do, right? And you got to be very careful. Uh, if you ask people a question like that, they might give you an answer because people don't want to appear stupid. They don't want to disappoint you. But they may have never thought of it. You know, why do I feel X, Y, Z? I don't know. I just do. And I think so you've got to be very careful here. Again, psychologists and others might be able to sort this out, but I think it's beyond the scope of at least our work. Um, in terms of regional findings, we have some regional data. To be quite honest, we weren't sure that the, even though we were in certain states, you also then have to make sure that you have a distrib uh, the right distribution across each of those states. And we're still trying to, to sort that out. Because what we didn't want to do was set up a situation where we said, oh, the South thinks this, the East thinks that. And we weren't completely uh, convinced that the methodology could bear that out. There were some differences. Not striking, not dramatic. Um, my recollection from the data is, you know, the people in the South are a little more positive about the economy than other parts of the country. That's to be expected. Um, on that question about, um, you know, should the state play a bigger a role, bigger role, lesser role in the in society, uh, Promet's hometown area, <laughs> people are a little more supportive of the state. Yeah, we know the history of, of West Bengal, right? I mean, exactly. Uh, so there's that, there's that, that difference. Uh, uh, and we also couldn't break down Hindu versus Muslim. Uh, my hope is in future uh, surveys, we will oversample the Muslim population so that we begin to see some difference in attitudes between Muslims and, and, and Hindus, because I think that would be a, a very interesting story to tell about the Indian experience. Yeah, Mr. Bustin, 
Can you share your data collection procedure, the way if you collect data, whether it's online collection or it's on paper collection? Or great, it's a great point. I, sh I should have I, uh, just answered briefly. It is, it is person to person interviews. We do not do telephone interviews in India. We do not do computer surveys in India. So it's person to person. Whether they were paid some incentives to participate in this type no, of? No, people were not paid an incentive. So you get a lot of people say, I don't have time for this. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. I, I can't tell you the number of times I hang up on posters at home. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm eating dinner, you know. <laughs> GSIR. I used to be in the diplomatic service. I'm frankly not surprised by the steep fall yeah. uh, between 11 and 12. So there's a pattern actually. Most of the governments in India lose steam after two years. And third, fourth, and the fifth year of the governments are really wasted as far as policy initiatives mm -hmm. and uh, new ideas for growth are concerned. You hit the third year of the present government. Mm -hmm. This has been happening again and again. I don't want to go into the history. Probably Mr. Chaudhary can give you uh, um, uh, some kind of a summary of that. So it is happening again. Most We should really have elections at the end of two to three years. <laughs> 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 put, put it slightly flippantly, but I'm not being entirely yeah, yeah, unserious yeah, about yeah, that, sir. Because the governments do lose steam for some reason. I don't want to go into the sociological or the political reasons for it. And you hit that, and that is one of the reasons over and above the international uh, repercussion, the repercussions from the international events. Maybe you could look at it as a pattern. Thanks. Uh, speaking of that pattern, we used to have the pattern in the US that the party in power would lose seats in the Congress in the sixth year of an eight-year two-term presidency. In the last two iterations of this, they've lost power in the second year of an eight-year. Right, so it, the pattern is accelerating in the US, or at least that small data point might suggest. I'm um, Anna Laninga. I work for Triveni and I helped to set up a Water Institute here for CII. Um, now, my question was actually regarding the public and private sphere, the government influence, a more freedom from the government, more f right. pr freedom, personal freedom, right. or more influence of the government sphere. Um, actually, I would like to know if you have more p data, deeper data behind that. Which fields do the people feel? that the government should go further into or not. Because um, if you say more responsibility for the private sphere, that means that you have the ability to act in the private sphere. And there are so many issues that are impossible to solve just individually. Mm -hmm. And people know that because he also with India, if you ask people what are the problems of the country, they do mention the roads, the, the waste, the water, pollution, environment, uh, all, uh, health, uh, mm -hmm. education. These are all spheres that we cannot individually solve as a problem, the climate, whatever. Um, so I was just wondering where does this come from, the more sphere, more, less government, the dissatisfaction of, with the government, as we said, very general. Um, would that, was my observation, maybe be because of the bureaucratic pr procedures that you have to go through if you have to get your license extended and mm -hmm. uh, the corruption that you, need, that you need to face as an individual when you do whatever with the local government? Um, or just... This is satisfaction, corruption, bureaucracy might lead to the answer. I was just wondering if there's any background. Uh, I mean, the short that. answer is, I think you make, you make a very good point, and we, we don't know the answer because we didn't ask mm. the right questions or enough questions. I mean, you, you do see um, what would appear to be a bit of a, I mean, on one hand, you see people saying, we want the state to play less of a role. And you see that there is concern about corruption, public corruption. Okay, you'd say oh, there's a connection there. We understand that. Except people are also concerned about private corruption. Um, and what we didn't ask, but I would be willing to bet, knowing not nearly enough about India, but I know a lot about the United States and about Europe. If you ask people, okay, you want the government out of your life more, and 
let's ask some specifics. Do you want the government to do less on A, B, C, D? And they, oh, no, no, we want the government to do all of that. Uh, again, that's one of the, of the uh, internal contradictions of, in public opinion, is that people, uh, I mean, what you're getting is sentiment here, right? It's just we're frustrated with government, either their inability to solve problems, or it may be corruption, or it may be uh, just the restraints that government have placed on life. Uh, but for goodness sake, don't take away our ins old age insurance. Don't take away the, uh, the roads. Don't, take, uh, don't privatize the roads. Don't privatize the schools, et cetera. So, I mean, that's, I'm, I would say, fortunately or unfortunately, it, it's, it's, it's um, one of the limitations of all of this, which is that people hold contradictory, what would appear to be contradictory feelings about these things. And so when a politician stands up and says, well, the public says X. Well, you should always remember the public also probably says Y. <laughs> and he doesn't mention that. Yeah, and I'd just add that the other two matrices that you need to keep in mind, especially in India, is that people who pay taxes tend to expect more from the government, but very few people in India pay tax. So therefore, there is that, that that's one side of it. Um, and second, corruption is an issue in the sense that uh, most of the surveys that come out on corruption show that the primary group of people who actually <clears throat> in, interface in corruption are the poor. And it's petty corruption, paying five rupees here, 10 rupees here, 50 rupees here, all through your day, all through your life, which me is the primary interface with government for a lot of them, uh, which doesn't necessarily happen as you go higher up the income. And, and we have actually asked in some of the surveys, a few surveys in the past, and you can find this on our website, we've asked people all over the world, including in India, you know, did you have to pay in the last month or whatever the time period was uh, uh, some bribe to a government official to get a government service? Uh, and you get very high percentages on many countries uh, of saying yes to that. Uh, did you um, uh, have to uh, pay to get your kid uh, into school or pay uh, uh, to get medical service at the government clinic? Things like that. And you, and you get very high. And as, as Pramit says, uh, I've never looked at the demographic breakdown of that. I'm sure that it's the poor who are the most uh, afflicted by that. Yeah, hi, my name is Arvind Gupta. I'm a technologist uh, and I work with the BJP, which is the India's biggest opposition party. Uh, uh, just on a lighter side, I call that B2C corruption. The corruption which you know uh, you talk about that and I agree with you, people get more affected by B2C corruption than B2B corruption, which is you know, big corporate houses to, or whatever government. Uh, my question was that how much of education, travel, and, uh, you know, technology playing a role in setting the right expectations uh, mm -hmm. with, with the people, especially the younger lot? Uh, travel, technology, and education, because I think that se it sets a lot of uh, changes in attitude and expectations. So any opinion or data points in that? Well, certainly uh, this data sh uh, shows that if you have a college education, uh, on a whole range of indicators. Uh, one, you're more upbeat about the economy. Uh, you certainly are more upbeat about the pace of modern life. Um, uh, so education does play a role. Um, we haven't released the technology data yet, and we haven't even analyzed it yet, but my guess is there would be a correlation there. Uh, you know, higher use of the internet or social media and so forth probably leads to a um, uh, a slightly higher perception of how things are going, etc. cetera. Um, uh, whether that has, the use of these technologies uh, beyond that, I mean, how, how that has affected, in other words, yes, we, we can correlate, okay, you say, you know, if you go on the internet, I don't know, more than the average person, does that mean you're more or less likely to to have a good opinion of the economy, we can, we, can do, we can do that analysis. What people are doing on the internet, the, the, our questions don't, you know, I mean, let's face it, are you looking at a pornography or are you reading the Wall Street Journal? I mean, and, and that was what we don't, we aren't able to, to answer. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Sunil Gupta, working as an IOD professional. You know, in the survey, what we saw, India is, you know, uh, Conceive China as a threat. Mostly everybody will agree. But there's a different school of thought also, which I also believe very firmly. 
I feel China, you know, if you, if you see right from 62 to early 50, late 50s, right. China is, you know, is a, it's a weakness for India. Like as per Nehru's policy, India, we were just, you know, in a very peaceful nation. So the attack from China on 62, it was, it was weakness for India. Similarly, now if you see the development of China, we see economic development, the military, you know, hmm. defense development. So, uh, we as India, I think we don't awake unless, until we see our neighbor awakening. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very positive trend, we at least seeing our neighbor as China, we are able to cope up with that and compete with the world. Mm -hmm. My comment. Yeah. Well, I am uh, Nirvai Sharma, I am Army veteran now with the Observer Research Foundation. Uh -huh. In fact, I think you are coming there yes. tomorrow. Yeah. But I won't be there and that's why I thought I would meet you right. today. Thank you. Uh, just one brief question. Uh, talking about the government being the attitude of the people saying anything like 90% people felt that it's all because of the government. Do you think it's because of the colonial hangover that we have in India wherein we have had the government doing things and the government is being, was looked upon, it is different in the US and many other countries. This is one. And one suggestion is that while we are talking about the attitudes of Indians, we look at Pakistan and mm. uh, there is a focus on Pakistan. I think we need to look at the other neighbors as well. Because they constitute even a bigger percentage of uh, population around us and they have a, an impact. So the attitude of Indians towards Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, even uh -huh. Afghanistan, Nepal, right. it, uh, it somehow loses, uh, we lose focus on it because when you talk of neighbors, Pakistan comes to our mind. Right. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, two things. One is, I mean, I agree with you. We, we didn't ask about Indian attitudes towards the other near neighbors. We did ask about China, um, uh, and as you see, um, basically people are, are, are worried about China, but not overwhelmingly worried about China. Um, it's not like Pakistan, but we didn't ask about the other neighbors. It'd be, it would be very interesting to, to do that. Um, uh, and your first question was, Yes. Um, it's absolute. It's only in a couple of European countries where people blame the banks first and government second. Uh, my name is Nilima Chawla. I work with Cancer Support. It's an NGO that looks after people with cancer. My question is, did your sample have an equal number of male and female respondents? And I didn't see anything disaggregated by gender. But did you come across any data at all that was significant, yeah. significantly different between men and women? It's a great question. Uh, our, uh, our survey is demographically established. So whatever the percentage of women are in the Indian population, then the survey roughly approximates that. Uh, you, so that and you do this among age groups and, and so forth and so on. The reason I didn't report, and you can look in the data and we, we can get that for you, there were no interesting stories to tell about gender differences. And I, I can tell you as someone who writes up these surveys over the years uh, in various countries and around the world, you always, one of the first questions you ask is gender stories. I mean, can we tell that women think this and men think that? And almost invariably, there's no difference. Uh, except, and I will tell you the one major difference. We ask a question about drone strikes. Uh, Indians actually are more supportive of drone strikes, drone strikes, right? Drones, and when the question was drone strikes in Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, Americans overwhelmingly think they're a good idea. Nobody else does. Indians actually feel better about drone strikes than almost anybody else who aren't Americans. And then it's only like 48% support drone strikes. What you found in Europe was not only did people oppose drone strikes, but it was the largest single gender difference we had ever seen in a question anywhere in the world on any subject. Women in Europe overwhelmingly are against drone strikes. We don't know why. Men are actually, uh, they're kind of divided. Women are overwhelmingly opposed. Uh, I don't know what the gender difference is on that question in India. Uh, I can certainly look. but. For the most part, uh, we, we didn't report, I didn't report, 
gender differences because you yeah you report when there's a difference when there's no real difference it's it's not worth uh, talking too much about but but it's an interesting question and I think it's I think what's interesting is that there aren't generally gender differences on most uh, subjects which would be which what you might expect well with that I'd like to say that we're coming to a close okay. Bruce thank you it's been uh, as usual uh, an exciting and interesting time to talk to you and, and I gather, I think he, he may have mentioned this, now they're going to do this survey every six months from now. So we're going to actually see a relatively good database showing trends over time, uh, which are present, especially in India. India has been sort of added to a lot of these type of surveys only recently, uh, which until, until now we don't have. And given Bruce's <coughs> already extensive knowledge and interest in India, I'm expecting, I'm expecting big things from the Pew Research Center to explain India to Indians um, over the next uh, several years. Thank you. Um, I'd like to give a applause. Thank you. And problem. Thank you. It was great. Great.